Hey, everybody, it's Michelangelo Caruso. I have a special uh, Talk To Me podcast for you today featuring Ron Sanderson. Hi, Ron. Hi, how's it going? I'm good, thank you. Ron has got a fascinating story. He's unlike anybody I've ever interviewed, and I think you're going to really enjoy what he has to talk about today. Before we get started, I want to remind you that if you're watching the video version of this podcast on, say, YouTube, that you can listen to any of the episodes on so many platforms, including iTunes and Podbean. And if you're listening on a, uh, on a platform, you can always catch the video version on the Michael Angelo Caruso YouTube channel. And when you're on the channel, please subscribe and click that silver bell so that you're notified of all new content. I first became aware of Ron Sanderson when I read about him in the local paper. I always read the local paper. I know not many people do that anymore, Ron, but I find it interesting what's going on in the community and I trip on in, uh, interesting personalities like yourself. The article was about uh, a talk you were doing at the local library. And what really intrigued me was it said that you're, you're uh, I can read the exact thing here. You're going to speak on mental health, but that you're an author, a speaker, and a mental health healthcare worker. And the title of the program was My Amazing Journey where you share experiences with autism and the challenges of learning social skills and handling sensory issues. So right away, I figured out you must be on the spectrum somewhere. Is that true? Yeah, so I was diagnosed with autism in 1982. And when I was diagnosed, there was only one in every 10,000 children who was diagnosed with autism. Now it's one in every 44 children. So it was very rare when I was diagnosed with autism. So I was more on the severe end for them to give me that diagnosis. In fact, I had to be intense speech therapy from age two to 16. When I was seven years old, my brother Chuck would introduce me to people. You need to meet my brother Ron. I think he's from Norway. He had me talk. No one knew what I was saying. So he actually became an expert in Norwegian languages just by having me speak. Interesting. Uh, I have so many questions for you about how this works, how it works for an adult parent. You have some children, yeah? Yeah, I have a six-year-old daughter, Michaela. I know she's not on the autism spectrum for one reason. Her first words were, okay, it wasn't, no, no. <laughs> Is that a joke? Yeah, that's a joke, but it was the first <laughs> word, though. It was okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so is she on the on the spectrum or not? No, she's not. And um, with um, autism, you're three times more likely to have a child with autism if you have a boy than a girl. So autism is 25 or 75 percent less in females than in boys. Why is that? I got the exact reason why. Men have the most logical mind. And well, wait a second. Wait a second. I know some women that would argue that point. But here, let me give you an example. You okay. go in an engineering class, out of 30 students, 27 are going to be male, and three are going to be female out of 30. If you go into an elementary class, I took one one time, 27 are going to be female on the average, three male. So the male mind is the most logical usually, and autism the most logical um, mind. And then if you would buy with... Um, other disorders, um, um, you'll find that more females have that disorder than males with, are more emotional, borderline. Yeah. So three out of four people with borderline are female, and, and that's most emotional mind. And then with autism, which is most logical mind, it's three out of four are males. So that's why I, I think that is. I am familiar with this long documented research that says men tend to be more linear thinkers. Uh, and in the early days, they, they use logical, but of course, we have to also say that there are women who are logical. Our overall point here is that women tend to be more emotional in their approach. Yeah. It doesn't mean yeah. that all women are emotional, and it doesn't mean that all men are logical, but in general, that's the pattern, yeah? Yeah, and it's more, we're pattern seekers, engineers. Yes. Where um, when you're dealing with children, you're not looking for a pattern, you're looking to be able to connect. And I think right, that's right. more of where it's at. Okay, very good. So you you gave you shared a statistic a minute ago that when you were diagnosed, that there was one one in ten thousand people was uh, diagnosed with autism. What year was this? Nineteen eighty-two, and I got diagnosed at Henry Ford Hospital 
which was on the cutting edge of um, autism diagnosis at that time. Yeah. And today, one in 40 is diagnosed with autism. What's going on, Ron? So I think there's a few reasons why. The main reason, I think, is we have better um, diagnosis test and research, so we know more of what we're looking for. And um, since autism is a huge spectrum, you have people who are very high needs on the autism spectrum, and then you have ones who are lower needs on the spectrum, and you have everything in between. I think that with better research and testing, we're getting a higher number of people on autism spectrum. And I also think too, is that with an increase in technology, there's an increase in autism. Temple Grandin said it best. If we didn't have autism in our gene pool, we'd have people sitting around a fire, clapping their hands, saying kumbaya, and we wouldn't have the ability to turn on a light because that technology comes from the systematic mind which comes from autism. Okay. So I think that's part of the reason too, is that we're seeing such an increase in knowledge in technology, and that adds to the gene pool of the autism gene being needed to develop that technology. So this is not a leading question. I'm not trying to take you anywhere here. I'm just trying to understand because there's a lot of people in society that say that there are other things at play. Um, People standing too close to the microwave oven, vaccines, all of this stuff. Are you suggesting that none of this stuff has anything to do with autism? I suggest this. You're asking the wrong question. You don't ask what causes autism. You ask what is a contributing factor of autism. For example, my mom was 24 when I was born. My dad was um, 20 plus years older than her. That was a contributing factor to me having autism when there's a vast difference in the ages of parents when the husband is older than the wife by more than 16 years it can be a contributing factor um, if you have a reaction to a vaccination that could be a contributing factor to autism but the main thing that causes autism is it's mainly genetics we know and what then there's older, other contributing about, factors too okay very good uh, what about women, uh, older women having children? Is that a factor? It can be a factor too. And like I said, is that you have all these different factors and a lot of people just want a simple answer. They want to know what causes autism and you're never going to get that answer because you're asking the wrong question. You need to ask what are some of the contributing factors and I, even I, um, mental health issues can be a contributing factor. We know that percentage wise, more um, parents who have a kid with autism percentage wise have some mental health issues too. Yeah. And there's much higher number of engineers who have children who are on the spectrum too. So there's contributing factors more than actual cause of autism. I like how you, you have us reframing the question. Um, what I struggle with sometimes as somebody who's intensely curious about actually finding the answer it seems to me that almost anything can be a contributing factor. Now we're looking for back to patterns again. What, what are the highest contributing factors? Which factors are contributing most frequently? That's where the magic is, right? Yeah, I agree. I'd say the two main contributing factors. Number one is genetics. Is genetically, we know there's a huge component to autism. And I'd say number two is that parents are having children later in life. And that um, men in particular are usually m marrying, since they're getting married later in life, women who are a little bit younger than them. And I think that's a contributing factor a lot too. Okay. Where would you recommend people going for the best information about autism? So for the best information on autism, I'd suggest going to the local university that has an autism program. So in Michigan, the gold standard is Western University of Western Michigan. It's the best place for resources. And then locally in Rochester Hills, Oakland University, they have a great autism program. They have me speak there quite a bit. And um, at MAC conference for Western Michigan, almost every year I speak at that conference. So those are two okay. kind of gold standards in this area. All right. And I think uh, for those of you that are going to try to look this up, it's actually Western Michigan University versus a different combination of words, Western Michigan University. All right. Uh, 
you have a terrific memory. Is that true? Yeah, so I have over 15,000 Bible verses memorized, word perfect. I got to work under Dr. Jack Van Impe, who is world renowned. They called him the walking Bible when he died in January 18th, two years ago. New York Times did a three page article of him right in the New York Times. And I got to work right under him for a summer. Do you remember everything or just certain things? I just remember certain things. Certain things stand out in my mind. I remember um, a lot of um, dates of different things and events that happened. And I, being a um, kind of historian buff, I ended up getting married on December 7th, which is the anniversary of Pearl Harbor and having autism. I came in like a kamikaze. And this December <laughs> 7th will be the 10th year anniversary of me and my wife getting married. Happy anniversary coming up. Thanks. And, you're, and you've memorized a, a good bit of the Bible, if not all of it. Yeah, a good bit. Um, I've memorized over two thirds of the New Testament and much of the Old Testament too. So what's the secret to that? Is that is that part of being on the spectrum? It's routine. So what I do is I put all my Bible verses on note cards and then about once a month I go over each card and then they stick to me. As David said in Psalms 119, 11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I not, might not sin against you. And then in my whole lifetime, I've only ever met one person with a better memory than me of the Bible, and that was Dr. Jack Van Impey. And he um, was the one who taught me how to memorize by subject. He said, you take a subject, you memorize all the verses on it, so you have them all right there like a concordance. So he was a big influence in my life and ministry. So I've heard the term autistic savant. Savant means genius, right? Savant means that you have just a huge amount of information, but it's limited in a certain area. So the most common type of savant on the spectrum is a calendar counter. And I met a calendar counter years ago at the library, in fact, the Rochester Library, and you could give him any date and he'd tell you what day of the week it was. So he said, when were you born? I said, 5, 10, 75. That's a Saturday, he said, that quick. And then he asked my wife when she was born, March of um, 682, and instantly he could tell you that was a Saturday. And he goes, that's good luck. And he was exactly right. Could do it quicker than I could put it in Google. So you there's know, only 10% of people with autism are savants. And of those 10%, about 90% of them, it's usually mathematical, their savant ability. And mine is um, something I have to work with the memory, but I've gotten it to a pretty good pace where I can memorize vast amounts of information on scriptures and dates and stuff like that. Are you a savant? I don't consider myself a savant. I've been diagnosed by many of the top researchers on autism and they diagnosed me as a prodigy. And the reason they said I'm a prodigy is that when I was in third grade, I won a major art contest, the Detroit Edison poster contest and got to meet Isaiah Thomas. And they said the two signs that someone's a savant or not a savant is a prodigy is number one they want a major art contest or major contest and number two is that they have a vast amount of information memorized and that they can learn stuff very quickly and switch fields very quickly and be an expert in multiple fields so my expertise is in the area of mental health theology and autism so i have a lot of information on those and that are well known prodigy is Temple Grandin, who I'll be presenting at a conference with on this Wednesday. I, I'm reminded that prodigy, I think the root word or the relational word is prodigious, which I think by definition is a lot, you know, so to your point, a prodigy processes a lot of information, becomes super talented, is able to display that talent and then tagged, tagged as a prodigy. Funny story, Ron. I met one time the original Rain Man. You know who that is? Kim Peck. That's right. And his dad was Francis. And you know what? Guess who wrote the foreword to my um, newest book? Who? Dr. Trefford. And you know who Dr. Trefford was? The guy who was, um, took Kim Peck and made the character Rain Man. And he just died December 14th. And you know what happened the day he died? No. The Lions, or the Packers beat 
um, our Lions. And he was a huge Packer fan. I got to speak at the Trefford Center in Wisconsin. And um, I'm in, in fact, his daughter um, lives right in Oakland County. One of his daughters and his other daughters, an ORU graduate for where I went to college. And she um, saw an article in the local paper, just like you did on the, when I wrote an article on the death of Dr. Jack Van Impey. And Van Impey died before Trefford. He just died this past year. And she called her dad and said, you need to meet this prodigy, Ron, who's on the autism spectrum. And he said to his daughter, I just wrote the foreword for his newest book, Small World. Small World is right. When I met Kim Peek, he was on the road with his dad. They were on the speaking circuit. and We spoke at the same conference. And he was showing off an Oscar that he had been given by Barry Levinson, who wrote the screenplay for Rain Man, the movie starring yeah. Hoffman and uh, Tom Cruise. And um, this guy was amazing. He was doing these live demos, you know, uh, about his memory. And one of his trick I call it a trick, but it was really just, I don't know how he did it. Um, he asked me what hospital I was born in. And then he, and then he, and then he asked me what city I lived in. Something like this. Yeah. And he told me how to drive from the hospital to the city. Like he had memorized the road memorized, yeah. or something. It was unbelievable. It's because his cereal bellum broken too so he no longer had memory like we have it he had a um crystallized memory of everything so everything that happened to him, he memorized he actually wasn't on the autism spectrum which a lot of people think when they hear him well he it wasn't was all a uh, brain um injury they had that caused his brain to work as a supercomputer and remember everything and he could he's the only person he could read like this he could read two pages at the same time and process all that information and he had a true photographic memory Amazing. but he couldn't tie his shoes so that yeah, extra yeah, memory dead. took away from coordination and other things that you and i take for granted his dad had to help him walk you're right he had no coordination yeah. it was like he was almost disabled yeah he was very disabled and, um his dad stated in their autobiography on his son is that um he didn't know how his son would get along without him and um, Kim ended up dying of um, heart disease before his dad. Yeah, sad, sad ending, but uh, yeah. I, I sure enjoyed meeting him. And it was, uh, again, a very interesting experience. Tell us about the autism spectrum. Everybody knows when you say the word spectrum, it means there's a continuum and you can be someplace on this continuum. Describe the continuum to us and where you are. Can you do that? Yeah. So there's... um different places on the autism spectrum. A lot of people put the nonverbal is um, on the lower end, but I don't like using the word lower end because in your limiting potential, I like to say that they have higher needs. So there's okay. people with very high needs on the autism spectrum. There's a guy, um, Seth, can't tie his, tr his shoes. If you sent him across the street, you'd have final destination 10. But he makes this artwork that's amazing. It's um, displayed on the Galapagos Island in museums. It's displayed in New York Times and all over the world. And a painting of his can sell for thousands of dollars. And then you have other people who people would say, oh, they're higher functioning and they're lesser needs, but they may struggle with employment. They may have master's degrees and yet they're working at McDonald's. I like to say this, there's no kid who's totally autistic. There's no kid who's not at all autistic. Even God has his autistic moments. That's why the planets spin. So well, there's varying degrees. It's a huge spectrum. Yeah, the spectrum itself then, are we talking about numbers? Are we talking about gradations? How do you describe it? Gradation, kind of the bell curve, where people fall on um, how many needs that they have that are more extraordinary than your typical kids. So it's not a number. Is it a temperature? Is it a color? How do you talk about where somebody is on the spectrum? It's more of a bell curve. So you say over here, you have someone who's very high needs. They can't dress themselves. They can't tie their shoes. Okay. Over here, you have at the farthest end, someone like Bill Gates or Elon Musk, who are billionaires and they, they know how things work. They've learned how to 
connect with people. They're not like the one over here is high needs who um is his ability to connect with other people socially is like um an old pair of Velcro shoes. They just can't connect well. Are you saying that uh, Musk and Gates are on the autism spectrum? A, um, Musk has admitted that he's Asperger's, which is high functioning autism. Okay. Bill Gates has a lot of characteristics of autism, and many people have theorized that he's on the spectrum. Yeah, I don't think he's Dan official. Ashley, he's admitted that he's been diagnosed with Asperger's too. Who's the third one? Um. Dan Aykroyd, the actor. Oh, Aykroyd. Okay. Yeah. He's yeah. I don't think uh, I don't think Gates is official. He he might be like an Not honorary yet, yeah. member. <laughs> yeah, he's an honorary. <laughs> uh, I know that you're uh, in addition to being a family man and a professional speaker, which blows my mind. Tell us about these uh, these you how many talks you've done and how many people you've been in front of. It's amazing. So I've um spoken live to over half a million people during my lifetime. I've spoken all the way from Madagascar to Israel. The most first famous person I've met during um, my time of travel is Muhammad Ali. I met him in 2002. My wife and I have met Screech from Saved by a Bill, rest his soul now. So I've met many well-known people and um, gotten to speak all over the world. I've been to 12 countries already. I hope to go to Australia next. That's one of the countries where I want to go. I have a Tasmanian devil. My main mascot is a honey badger because a honey badger doesn't give a, you've seen the video, you can fill in the four letter words that go with it. And I have a prairie dog that is one of my mascots, prairie pup. And he's been to all the countries I've been to, met all the celebrities. When I met Kurt Armstrong, Booger from Revenge of Nerds, I said, can you put your finger up your nose and hold the prairie dog? He said, I'll take it one step better. I'll shove him up my nose. So Prairie Pup's even been up the nose of Kurt Armstrong, booger from Revenge of the Nerds. Well, if, if you can say that about your mascot, you're in the big time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so um, I know you've also authored some books. How many books now? So I have now, I have three traditionally published books. My first book was a top selling book on autism for Christian families. And it's um, Parents Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom. My third book is Views from the Spectrum, A Window in the Life in Faith, Your Neurodivergent Child. And that's the one that Dr. Trefford, who um, worked with Kim Peck, he was in fact the top expert in the world on savants and prodigies. There's a whole center in Wisconsin named after him. And, in August of last year, I got to speak at that center, the Trefford Center, and then his daughter, Jill, lives right in Oakland County, so she comes to a lot of my speaking events, which is kind of cool to know that the top expert on prodigies, his daughter is coming to hear me speak, and I'm on the pro uh, prodigy with autism, so it's kind of cool Beautiful. how God works in that way. Where can people uh, pick up your books? Is it an Amazon or a website thing? So they can get it on Amazon. Barnes and Nobles. Um, books now, when they first come out, like a view from the spectrum, they're only in the stores, Barnes and Noble, for about the first two months. Then they're off to their next books that they got in there. So they were in Barnes and Nobles originally. Now they're on Amazon and you can get them from the website on um, Barnes and Nobles and any major um, book distributor, they'll have my books on there. I love it. I, you're so fun to talk to, man. Oh, thanks. It's Ron Sanderson, everybody. S-A-N-D-I-S-O-N. -S His website is spectruminclusion.com. And that's where you can find out more about where Ron is speaking and get pointed to all of his books and resource materials. Um, you're a breath of fresh air, Ron. You're a, a role model, not only for people who are on the spectrum, but you're also, I think, a role model for the rest of us because you've, you're you making a great life for yourself and you're educating others and you're a helpful citizen, all the things I think most of us aspire to. Oh, thanks so much. And I still have challenges with autism. I say I have my autism moments. I remember the first girl I ever asked out on a date, she said this to me, why do you have only monotone? There's no inflection in your voice. You sound like a transformer. So I thought I'd be cute. I thought I'd be wise. I said, 
I'm more than meets the eyes, and I still didn't get a date with her. And if you listen to me on the podcast, you're going to notice that when I say names, I don't pronounce them right. And there's something that's real unique about my ability. Since I learn everything visually, I have no phonetic ability. The biggest scam in U.S. history wasn't Enron. It was hooked on phonics. I cannot learn anything phonetically. So when I say like Kim Peck's name, I'm going to say it wrong because my brain doesn't process names. Names are neolism in Greek, which means a makeup word or new word. And a lot of um, things like I can I translate two thirds of New Testament from Greek into English. There's only one reason I could learn that language. And when I took Spanish, I couldn't learn Spanish at all. Greek is a dead language, so they have to teach it visually. Where Spanish, you go to Mexico, they're speaking Spanish. You go to Spain, they're speaking Spanish. So it's a live language, and I can't learn any live languages. That's why speech, even English, took me from age 2 to 16 to be able to pronunciate words. And it doesn't come instinct for me. When I do my interviews with you, if I say brother, I got to think that I got to make my tongue go through a bridge and back again. If I say the word Jill, I got to make my tongue go up and down. And it can sound like the name Jill or like the gel you put on your hair. So a lot of people, if they listen closely to me, they'll see my disability is still there, even when I speak. But I've learned ways to compensate for it. And my main way of compensation is humor. Well, I think you're a very funny young man. Uh, let's talk about this for a second before we before we go. The pronunciation thing, you'd mentioned nihilism a minute ago. Maybe you meant neologism? Yeah. And see, okay. I can't even, I know the word, I can see it, but my brain can never make the words come out the right way with yeah. a lot of words. And, and I didn't how know how to pronounce Kim Peek's last name. It's just spelled P-E-E-K. And I thought I heard people say Peek, so I just jumped on Peek. When you said Peck, I'm like, I wonder if I pronounce it wrong. No, I pronounce it wrong, but I see it wrong. Can you say Kim Peek if I just ask you to say it? Kim Peek. But if you ask me um, 10 minutes later, I'll say it wrong again. You're back There's a Kim girl I worked with who was a nurse, and she was high up in the nursing. She'd come to my events, and she'd always ask me to say the founder of um, Facebook's name, Mark rubble or whatever because every time i say it i say it different and i can never say it twice the same way but that's again that autism way my brain works but then i can take vast amounts of information get you dates on things quote vast amounts of scriptures and um, reference perfect but then when it comes to stuff with pronunciation or words i'm going to say I know the word right in my brain, but when it comes out, it doesn't come out the way I see it. So if I ask you to say Mark Zuckerberg, you can say it. Yeah, but then if you ask me 10 minutes later, I'm going to say something different. Mark say Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg, you just said it, yeah. Wow. But then if I don't repeat it, like an echo when I say it again, it's going to be totally different. My brain can't remember phonetically. Amazing. It has zero phonetic, but it made my memory ability out of this world. Like I said, in my um, 47 year life, I've only met one person who can do what I do with quoting the scripture. And what's interesting, too, is that Dr. Jack Van Impey was a prodigy. And the reason I know that is that he was a top accordion player in the world. And he, in fact, became um, well known by doing the accordion for a famous evangelist named Billy Graham. And for him to be able to do the accordion and have that photographic memory, it goes with that creativity, music ability, and the memory makes him a prodigy. The only difference what it is he wasn't on the autism spectrum, so you wouldn't hear him mess up words like I do. And I remember one time I got to see the live showing or live recording of his show and he hits his head and he goes, I can't remember that verse. I said, Psalms 8, 2, Matthew 21, 16, from the lips of children, infants, you have ordained praise. And his producer covered up the microphone so we can't let him know that his intern outquoted him today. Oh, that's too funny. What a great story. Well, it's so, right in Troy. Uh, such a pleasure talking with you today. Congratulations on all your success, Ron. And I, I, I certainly wish you the best. Let's keep in touch, okay? All right. Thanks so much. 
Thank you, sir.